Hello and welcome to Paper Traders, a show where two average Joes try to beat the market. I am your co-host Eric and I'm here with Danny and I'm here to remind you to like, subscribe, click the button, get in on the conversation on whatever platform you're on. Uh, today we have a little bit of a surprise, something that we've been waiting for almost a year for. <laughs> But, uh, it's a couple of months, but yeah. apparently it's a year. Ke Kevin Matris, welcome to the studio again. Thank you. So to tell everybody uh, real quick, Kevin's here to answer questions and talk about things that are going on currently in the markets. If you have anything, get it in now while he is here because we can't really expect to see him for maybe another year. So he's here now. Kevin, how's it going? Good. Yeah, you happy with the markets? Uh, yeah, I mean, this pullback has been a spectacular buying opportunity. So, I mean... I would have preferred to see the market just keep on going higher and higher without any pullback. But this pullback that we have seen has been fantastic. And even in this morning's PFP, I wrote that I was a big buyer yesterday and I got in almost near the lows of the day. And I ended up getting into a bunch of triple leveraged S&P, which is XPSL. I got into the triple leveraged small cap ETF, TNA. So I'm totally happy. It's a pretty awesome totally name, right? Totally happy. TNA. It's a good yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where's my little symbols? I don't have it. Oh. There, there we go. go. <laughs> The, uh, I'll tell you, the, who knows if this is the low low, but it does remind me of when I had gotten in on the low, which was, I believe it was December 24th of last year. Uh, was it last year? I can't remember. Was it 2018, I believe? 2018. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. So it was December 24th of 2017 when the market was collapsing. Everybody was talking Freaking about a recession. Out. Everybody was like, oh, the inverted yield curve, which is nothing yes. but a hoax. And on the 24th, right near the low, I piled into TNA and SPXL, and we all know what happened to the market after that. I don't know if this is going to be as epic of a buy, but uh, but it sure did feel good yesterday. But to be honest with you, if it goes down a little bit more, I will be a big buyer because I think once this blows over, all of this pent up demand is going to send stocks skyrocketing. Well, let's just jump into it then, because you're kind of already hitting <clears throat> on some of the things that we wanted to touch on today. So, not so much as important, you know. But the coronavirus is now starting to kind of take over, and everybody's freaking out. Well, some people are freaking out. I feel yeah. like it's kind of up and down because yesterday we were getting the CDC coming out saying, hey, this is not of, of when it will happen, but or not if it if, will happen, but when. when it will happen. And then you had um, the, uh, what was the gentleman's name? Um, Larry the Kudlow. Oh, okay. um, he was the National Economic Counselor. And he came out as saying that this is a human tragedy and not an economic tragedy. So you kind of have two kind of sides playing off of each other and – as we can see in the markets, investors are definitely reacting in a, in a negative way. Right. Do you see this being in a positive light, though, as, as we're getting better uh, prices and we're getting that valuations to come down a little bit for investors to get in? The uh, I mean, yes, it is a human tragedy. Uh, but if you look at what the uh, health and human services guy said, he says there is really no immediate risk to the health of Americans right now. Mm -hmm. Who knows what that will be as we move forward in time, but when you, we take a look at it from an economic standpoint, granted, I, this was before the CDC came out yesterday, but they were saying that uh, the estimates were that it would maybe take two-tenths of one percent off of GDP in Q1, and maybe it would take another two-tenths of one percent off of our GDP a little bit later in the year. That is not that big of a deal. But especially, that's only us, though, right? Like, that only sure, affects us. But, I mean, this is the U.S. stock market. Yeah. Now, granted, a lot of the companies, we do do business overseas, but let's look at China. They are the epicenter of where this whole thing started. And yeah, where everything's pretty much made nowadays. But if you look at the companies in the S&P, uh, for the S&P companies, only about 6% uh, of revenue comes from China. So we think about what a big market China is, but when you look at how much revenue is actually coming from China for these S&P companies, it's really not that big of a deal. So there is going to be an economic impact, but this is something that our economy can easily support. 
Oh, I mean, that's a pretty good take on it. I mean, because you read about it and it just sounds like the world's going to end. You know, every article is, oh, China's got another 10 cases. Right. Italy's now on lockdown. Yep. You know, South it, Korea. I mean, South Korea, they're saying that's the next largest outbreak right now. You right. have Iran, United States. So, I mean, the media is definitely fueling the fire to the scare, I believe. I, is it granted or is it kind of merited or is this something that we really should be backing or something that we should be taking advantage of? You know, of? I think the media, I mean, they always hype everything up unnecessarily. Everything is about fear and doom and gloom. I They're have trying to, agree. to get clicks. So everything is sensationalized. I agree. Uh, and you really have to do your own research and reading to be able to figure out what the real truth is. Nonetheless, uh, this is something that we do have to concern ourselves with. We have been lucky uh, that uh, that it you know there has been a lot of containment policies uh, and we haven't really been affected. But as the CDC has come out yesterday, they did say, look, there, there's almost no way you're going to be able to keep it from yeah, the United in, States. Right. It's already here, right? So mm -hmm. there is going to be a community spread. It's only a matter of when and how bad it's going and to be and how to control it, right? But when you, again, going back to the economics of it, the reason why people are worried and the reason why stocks sold off is because. Uh, you know, the, the travel restrictions that you are now seeing implemented around the world, it is affecting the flow of people. It's also affecting the, uh, 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 impacting the flow of goods. And that is why people are starting to worry about these supply chains. And it's going to ultimately have an impact on people's bottom lines. But again, how long this lasts, that is ultimately going to be the determining factor. But right now, I don't think panic is warranted. Concern is warranted, but I don't think panic is warranted. And by the way, let me just say this, too. The last couple of days has felt like, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. Well, at least Very that's what the media so. makes it feel right. like. But from the peak that we saw about a week or so ago to the low of yesterday, the market's only down. 2,000 points. Yeah. 8%, the S&P is down like 8.1%. Mm -hmm. And it, the reason why it feels so bad is because it happened so quick. Right. But an 8 to 10% correction is ordinary. You see this all the time. And if you take a look at how the market has skyrocketed between Q4 and yesterday with almost no correction... Bring it on. I'm I glad am, there is a correction. I'm literally just yeah. seeing the preach meme in my head. You know, like, <laughs> I've been echoing Seriously. this to all the people that I've heard freaking out. Like, literally 2,000 points is not that big of a dip. Right. And it'll pop right back, as all this is, is pretty much sensationalized fear. Yeah. Now, again, it could get worse. But I think even Warren Buffett the other day had said, has anything changed in the long-term outlook of the economy over the course of the next 10 or 20 years? No. no. <laughs> so you now have the opportunity of buying stocks that you only wished you could have gotten in at a few short days or even a few short months ago. So, yes, if you're looking at some of your favorite stocks or new stocks on your watch list a couple of weeks ago and you're like, ah, these things, I missed so much of the move. Now they've come down. Grab them. Jump on it. Yep. Get these stocks I, because I think they're going to be higher by the end of the year. Agreed. I definitely agree. And I, I have my eye on a few of these, especially FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple. They look very attractive at this point. But yeah. you do want a little bit more of a pullback, I feel like. Um, they didn't move too much, at least those big uh, blue chip companies. Um, like you said, though, you don't know how much more downturn we're going to see. Um, but I feel like if it does hit the United States, that I guess fear factor might increase just a little bit. Do you think that when it hits, not again, like <clears throat> the CDC said, if it hits, um, we're going to see much more downturn? Should we kind of hold our breath and, and wait a little bit longer? Or should we kind of dollar cost average in? What kind of strategies should investors kind of deploy here? Well, I mean, as I had said at the top, uh, I just bought yesterday, <laughs> and I'm waiting for more opportunities to buy. So again, I mean, if we go lower, I would be a buyer. If we see some continued strength, I would also be a buyer. I wouldn't just buy willy-nilly. I ended up buying the, uh, the SPXL and TNA because it was one of the quickest ways to immediately deploy capital. Right. It, within the last, you know, 15 minutes of the day, I'm not going to try to put in 15 orders on, you know, varying stocks. Right. I did that quickly so I would be able to take advantage of a price point that I was looking at. Uh, but that way uh, you're not stuck in one stock. You kind of get the kind of broad market of, of the whole thing. Is that what you're 
kind yeah, of alluding to. But again, I, I wanted to quickly put some money into the market. And yeah, I did feel like the indices were overdone. But yes, moving forward, I mean, in the last maybe six months, it felt like almost everything was going up. There will be more distinct winners and losers as we move forward in time. So if you do want to start deploying more capital in individual stocks and not just pile into the ETFs, you are going to have to pick your, your, you know, your spots accordingly. But yeah, there's, there's some stocks that you're definitely going to want to wait for a bigger pullback. There's other stocks you're going to want to avoid altogether. I would definitely want to avoid anything that is in the uh, travel-related industry or lodging industry, tourism. I would be worried about that stuff. But there's plenty of other areas that are actually going to do just fine. So, you know, I just think that take a look at those charts. There are some obvious support levels you know, uh, I talked about those in today's PFB, but look at those and uh, and then start picking and choosing your entry points accordingly. Fair enough. Well, real quick here, let's take a look. See, we got a lot of questions here. Um, I kind of feel, Scotty, <clears throat> that we already talk, talked about supply chain. Kevin, did you have anything to add? We have something talk, somebody talking about the S&P ability to sell material goods in the U.S. depends heavily on the Asian supply chain. I think that you, you were talking about the S&P, you were talking about how much it, uh, it comes from China. What about supply? Do you, how, do you feel like that's going to be affected by this coronavirus thing. Uh, you know, I mean, the, it, if obviously it is going to be affected. This is why the sell-off has happened, because nobody really has been able to make an accurate assessment about which companies are going to be experiencing this kind of problem, what the magnitude is going to be. But I believe that, uh, I had heard before that when the administration was trying to work out a trade deal with China, and then we had all of these tariffs, there were plenty of companies that were already trying to uh, reroute their supply chains anyways. And the, uh, the story that I had read, which was actually quite interesting, they said that the, the trade, I hate calling it a trade war, but the trade spat that we had last year, uh, actually was a blessing because there were plenty of companies who were able to start rethinking their, uh, their supply routes and come up with other kinds of redundancies and alternatives. But again, there are going to be companies that, uh, that are going to suffer. But if, if the early estimates, which were uh, that uh, it was going to take maybe two-tenths of 1% off of Q1 GDP and maybe a little bit more later in the year, at this point, I would still consider those setbacks to be relatively modest. Now, again, some companies who get a, a disproportionate amount of their revenue from China, those companies are going to be hit way harder than a company that, uh, that has very little revenue coming from there or does very little business with, with China. So you, you really now have to look at where is this money coming from you know, where are they getting their supplies? So I think the investor really needs to dig a little bit deeper into those companies they're looking at just to see what the coronavirus impact, impact is going to well, be. I mean, Apple's a good example. They already came out and said they were going to miss their earnings. So Right. I mean, that kind of just shows you that some companies are already kind of looking forward and ahead and going, hey, listen, this is going to affect us. But I mean, I don't even think they really knocked off that much. Does anybody happen to know the number what? I'm not sure what it was, but uh, I know they were a little bit worried about supply. They were also worried about uh, about decreased demand for some of their products as well. What's interesting, though, is I can't remember how many stores they had closed uh, at its peak, but I believe that they have reopened about half of their stores in China. So that gives you some indication as to you know where Tim Cook's head is at. Um, uh, the, so, so yeah, uh, I, I think it's all interesting, but, uh, oh, the, the, the other thing is, is while it's true, the CDC is talking about how the United States has to worry about, um, you know, it, it coming, uh, you know, here to, uh, to the U S they said that the coronavirus outbreak, they believe has peaked in China. So while you're seeing it, the, the number of cases is increasing elsewhere around the epicenter. They're saying that we've already seen peak coronavirus spread in China. So that's good. So what was that? Was that maybe a couple of weeks for it to peak? And now yeah, it's, it's finally been about a month, so, right? So maybe there's another couple of weeks before we see this peak as well. And hopefully at that point, 
you have more policies around the world for containment, for remediation, and hopefully we're going to hear something from the uh, the administration about what we're doing with vaccines. Uh, on that note, I did hear that we were going to be like maybe about six weeks away from a vaccine. Yeah, I but- know that we did some uh- – uh, we have in Georgia a, a facility working on it right now. I know that they got a huge grant from the government. So I know that we're working pretty hard to, to get that figured out. Um, with the meantime and the fear still kind of looming over us, I know you gave us some kind of plays that you made um, with the kind of broad <clears throat> markets. But is there anything that I guess some safety nets like commodities and gold and silver that um, investors should be looking at? Or is that kind of more of a uh, I guess a smoke and mirrors play that people are kind of jumping on and, and more or less like the fear kind of pushing them towards those type of investments. No, I don't think it's smoke and mirrors. Uh, I mean, commodities, uh, I mean, you know, you take a look at all of the products and products need commodities in order to, uh, to build their products. Uh, the, in, in regard to gold, there are some uh, industrial applications for gold, way more for silver and some of the other things like platinum and palladium. Mm-hmm. Gold, everybody likes to think that it is a, uh, it's a safe haven and, uh, and a, a store of wealth. I never was a gold bug, but, I mean, if I see that, uh, that there is a trend developing, I have no problem in getting on it. I don't have to love something in order to trade it. Sure. But I, I, would, I would dissuade somebody from abandoning equities plowing everything into gold and thinking the world's going to come to an end and they're going to get rich because gold is going to skyrocket. I just don't see that happening at all. Uh, also, too, I would tell you to, uh, to take a look at, uh, at you know, the stats right now. You take a look at the earnings yield on the S&P. The earnings yield is, what, like 5.5%. Yep. The 10-year is, what, 1.3%. Mm-hmm. So you've got over a four 400 basis point spread between the 10-year and the, uh, the S&P, the earnings yield. And that shows that, uh, that stocks are still far more attractive than anything else out there. So if you want to put a little bit of money in gold, I don't care. Uh, but uh, just but I would still pay attention to equities. Yeah. Well, this is good. You're actually hitting all the points of these. I actually had just showed you the <clears> chat <throat> screen because I was getting. There's probably nothing oh, there yet. That? Yeah. I got so overwhelmed. I should with put my stuff glasses here on if that, you want me to read something. Yeah. I mean, I was so overwhelmed with how many things came in here. And <clears> he actually went right down the line, knocked a bunch of stuff out of here. So hopefully, uh, AMC Tube. This hopefully answers your question about what's going on with smart money and Scotty. Hopefully, this answers your question. About By the, the way, I don't trends. see anything on yeah. the screen. But who cares? I'm fully <laughs> overloaded right <laughs> okay. now, catching up. I had to turn it on for you so you keep up with everything. Everybody. Okay. So people are saying, you know, you can't trust China. You can't tell you their government's manipulating data. You know, I kind of feel like we're bashing this go over the head. You went over the uh, uh, gold and silver plays. <clears throat> um, people are talking about uh, EQX and BTG. Do you happen to know anything about these two? Uh, I don't even know what that is. Ask the guy what those things are. Uh, uh, Mike Peters, get your information in. He's looking at the chat screen. He'll be able to tell you about those right away. What was the ticker? EQX and BTG are the two stocks he's asking about. I'll look up EQ. Is this thing set up? Well, uh, these, yeah. Well, these guys are uh, looking at that. I'm going to take I'm this chance. I'm getting off your chat thing, by the way. Yeah, that, this is the window <laughs> up. <laughs> the other window right next to you, you can get into there. Uh, so it's a Gold Corp. Equinox Gold Corp. To shift gears while these guys are looking at that real quick, make sure you guys go to zax.com slash promo. Zax.com slash promo. Today, the deal is the Zax Insider Trader. Find stocks so strong that company officers are pouring them into their own portfolios. Uh, you can sign up now for 30 days. This ends, um, well, actually, I take that back. This is good for 30 days, and the opportunity ends Sunday, March 1st. That so doesn't ma- give me a lot of time, so. Yeah, make sure you sign up. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is only a dollar, too, guys. Yep, only a dollar. So make sure you sign up for that just to check it out. It'll give you all the tools available that we have here at Zach's, as, lo- as well as access to Tracy Reinick. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of people follow Tracy. I mean, she does a, a bunch of media content here yeah. with the podcast videos for earnings. So if you follow anything on that, go ahead, give her, give her a follow and, and a look at this portfolio. I'm sure you won't be disappointed, so. Yeah, you'll be able to check out what she's doing and uh, see what her choices are for insider buying. So sign up, Zach's, well, I guess you can't call it insider buying, but kind of in a way. <laughs> insider trading. <laughs> insider trading, which sounds just awful. But yeah, get in on that, Zach's.com slash promo. All right, guys, what do you got for, the, for our friend Mike Peters here? Uh, BTG, right? BTG. 
Gold Corp, right? Is that what yep. it was? Or BT Gold Corp. Uh, look, I don't know much about it, but I see that the uh, the chart looks fantastic. So, I mean, already uh, I am a fan of it. Let me just see if I can get some fundamentals here. Uh, While he's looking at that, I'm going to check out EQ. Yeah, it's an Equinox Gold X. Corp. They so also are it on. It is a three. Uh, it's got a, a style score, VGM of A, which is nice. You know, I mean, the, the, the thing that I would look at, uh, since I am unfamiliar with this and I don't really trade a lot of gold stocks, is I'm just looking at the earnings estimates. And if you were to, I'm, I'm on the, uh, the snapshot right now. Uh, oh, no, I'm on the uh, Zach's Equity Research Report. And you can see the price consensus and surprise chart, and you got all those squiggly lines uh, on top of the price. And you can see that 2020, 2021 are going virtually straight up. So that shows that earnings estimates are going up dramatically for this stock which is why you're seeing the price go up and you're probably seeing a bunch of people chase these earnings. So as long as those lines, those earnings estimates are continuing to go up, I would definitely continue to look at this. All right. Well, there you go. Mike Peters, that uh, takes care of one of them. Uh, I don't know if dollar sign IQ is something we follow. Uh, is it? I don't know. Anybody know? I, I don't believe He so. didn't give me a name. He just gave me the, the number. Let me put it in. Not a valid input. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we follow that one. It's okay. Uh, we, we don't follow all stocks. It, it does take some analyst coverage to help uh, give it some of our ranking systems and, and get all that data I in mean, there. So This is I, also, he's actually wrote in here that it's the Netflix of China, so that might not be something that we're following. I see a stock, IQ. It's I-Q-I-Y-I. -I yeah, yeah, that's it. the one who's actually, he just typed in the, okay. the exact thing there. Uh, so I see that that thing is going up as well. Let me see what the, uh, the fundamentals look like. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, very interesting. It seems like a lot of people here have some questions for you, Kevin. Hopefully you don't get overwhelmed. Uh, film and television. Uh, I do see that the, uh, the, the earnings estimates, or I should say the earnings in general, are higher year by year. Looks like they're still losing money, uh, and they've kind of flatlined for a bit. Um, Again, I would have to look. Here, let, let me go off uh, on a tangent a bit. I don't know how much money this company is pouring into film and television, and it reminds me about what I've been hearing recently. I heard that Tom Cruise had to stop production on Mission Impossible. He is held up somewhere. I don't know if he's in Italy or somewhere, but they had to stop production on his movie. There are other movies and television shows, I believe, where that, that are, are filming overseas where they've had to stop production. So if let's just say that they are heavily invested in producing their own content, how much more is that going to cost? What kind of delays are they going to, uh, to come up with? Once again, Especially if, if they're in China, If it too. is China, this is the epicenter where everything is happening. So I don't know what the impact would be, but I would, pro for me, because I don't know anything about it, but those would be my first fears, those would be the things that I would want to search for right away. I'm in a couple of Chinese stocks. I am in Alibaba. I am also in JD.com. I can't remember what they do. I knew when I bought it. <laughs> but, uh, but that's been going up. Uh, so I am in some that I would consider to be somewhat safer plays, uh, but I don't think I would rush into something that is so heavily involved in China without really knowing what everything about it. When I do look at this, though, I see that they are a three, but they have a VGM score of F. So it doesn't mean they're bad, but of all of the Zacks rank threes, it means that these have the lower valuations of all of the other threes. They score uh, more poorly on growth because they're a D than all of the other threes. They also are scoring more poorly on momentum than all of the other threes. So there may be some better companies that uh, that you can pay attention to. So that, that's just my two cents. All right, so here's a broad, gener uh, broad question here. We got uh, Scott E. with <clears throat> energy and oil thoughts, deep lows, uh, deep, yeah, deep lows, multi-year lows. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? I Worth mean, buying? 
He's right. The, uh, the, you know, energy has collapsed. I don't know where the bottom is. I haven't really been paying attention to it that much. Uh, there could be some more downside, but whether you buy it now or whether it's now on your radar screen and you're, you're, you're looking for a place to buy, um, I think it's fine to, uh, to keep that in the forefront of your mind. The, the big question is, uh, how much demand is going to be lost? Because this demand isn't coming back. This demand is lost. So some demand may be just deferred, but there's some demand that is actually going to be lost and it's just never coming back. And that means you're going to see more and more supplies being built up, which of course is going to weigh on prices. Right. So I think, yeah, and I haven't really been looking at oil, uh, but I know that it has fallen and I know I will be looking at it. So I don't think I would tell anybody to get in, but well, yeah, here's pay a attention. Weird segue that I'm going to play into just because the fact that we're talking about energy. So how does Kevin Matris feel about green energy? Uh, what do you mean? How do like, you feel uh, about is it? it worth investing into solar stocks? I know that you're very pro Tesla. I mean, wh where do you feel <clears throat> in terms of green energy? It's worth putting your money into now. Look, green energy is not going away. And uh, if you take a look at, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter what your thoughts are on climate change. The fact of the matter is that uh, clean energy is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you take a look at uh, the institutional money flow, institutional money flow into ESG conscious stocks and ESG conscious funds. I believe that you've seen four times the money flow go into these kinds of stocks last year versus the previous years. So if this is where the smart money is allocating resources, you can pretty much assume that uh, this is something that's going to be a thing as you move forward. So yes, I don't know of anything in particular. I am interested in solar. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I was applauding Musk when uh, they, uh, he, he ended up absorbing Solar City into Tesla. Uh, the guy's a genius. Uh, he's did, done a great thing with uh, the automobiles. Uh, I believe his batteries are going to be pervasive around the world and solar energy, even though they still have to worry about um, uh, cost consciousness and all of this stuff, that, that is going to be a bigger thing as you move forward in time. So it sounds like you're very go green. Uh, I don't I know how I don't know how much green I have in my portfolio. Probably very little uh, outside of Tesla. Uh, and again, you know, there Tesla isn't. People aren't flocking into that stock because of Solar City. But I'm sure that a lot of informed investors they know. Hey, here's this other gem that's going to be something down the road. So they're not just a battery company. Uh, yeah, but but batteries. Apparently, I they mean, make pretty cool flamethrowers too. <laughs> I don't know how green those are. He makes a lot of cool stuff. Look, you can admit that. I know people, he's a polarizing figure. You've got people who want to short the stock. All those people are now broke, but that's <laughs> the way it is. Um, but the guy is a genius, and I wouldn't want to bet against a genius. And anybody who did bet, bet against him, when it was at 400 bucks, 300 bucks, then 200, then 200, $250 or whatever, all of those people are probably now regretting it. Uh, so, look, there's going to be bumps along the way, but I think that uh, that Tesla, if I were to look at this, you know, a looking ball is like, where is Tesla going to be 10 years from now? Who knows? Maybe this is a company where you can say, oh, I got in 10 years ago and I made a, a th another 1,000% yeah, like return. The time, yeah. Right. 5,000%. Well, here's another interesting segue. So we've got somebody who's asking about Microsoft, Apple, or MasterCard. Okay. Well, I mean, which one of those would you put in your, <clears throat> into your portfolio? Uh, I like them all. I think Microsoft is great. Sure, that they have come down recently, so has everything. But those are some big mainstay companies mm -hmm. that aren't going anywhere. Right, I agree. They're blue chip. And, you know, Microsoft, they, uh, they're a big player in cloud. They're not as big as Amazon. They just got that Jedi contract from the right. government. I yeah, mean, that's got to be paying some bills, right? Yeah, the uh, I think that's, uh, what is it, $10 billion over 10 years? Correct. I can't remember how many. It's a, it's a 10 year thing. It was 10 billion. So yeah. much money. But uh, but yeah, I mean, cloud is only going to get bigger as well. Oh, yeah. So 
in all of these payment companies. Well, with, yeah, with 5G rolling out, I mean, the cloud services are going to explode, in my opinion. I mean, you have to think about how it's going to affect every single industry, not just, you know, well, people on It feels on like everything phones, is so. going to cloud. Everything. I yeah. mean, software even now is just cloud. Who's uh, Google's got that online gaming system that's 100% <clears throat> cloud-based. I mean... Yeah, everybody's going to a cloud gaming system, so it's... Yeah, I mean, you really just don't really need a computer, per se, really, anymore, when everything that you need is right there in the cloud. Yeah. Just but connect to the internet. It's craziness. I mean, technology, man. By the way, there's a lot of other smaller companies that, uh, that you know, are, are making a foray into cloud, so... Uh, some of those other smaller cloud companies could have even bigger returns than than you know you may expect to see from Microsoft. I still think Microsoft's a fantastic company, and again, cloud computing is wonderful. Uh, yeah, one of those being Dropbox. T- actually, take a look at some of those other ones. Yeah, Dropbox right now. I know that that that's a fairly pervasive company. I mean, they're they've integrated into Microsoft, so I mean, they're in Windows, so they're currently at twenty dollars a share. And they are a VGM score of a C. So, I mean, maybe not. A bad I haven't looked at it. What's the. Uh, uh, DBX? The symbol? Yeah, I yeah mean, they just went IPO what, last year, I believe. Not like very long ago. ago. That's the reason I had to look. I wanted to make sure because I thought they had gone IPO, and I was like, let's take a look real quick. Yeah. They are a Zax rank one. Yeah. I mean, this is a fairly. Like I said, they've in- infiltrated Windows. You get a Windows machine now, and Dropbox is automatically integrated into it, as long as well as their OneDrive by Microsoft. Yeah, it's but. interesting. I'm looking at uh, at 2019 estimates uh, were uh, looks like 48 cents or just under 50 cents, something like that, mm-hmm. and it looks like 2020. Where is that line coming in at? Maybe around 58 cents, and it looks like. 2021 with the 50, 60, maybe around 65 cents. So yeah, you can see that uh, that earnings estimates are continuing to uh, to go up. I don't know anything about Dropbox, so uh, it's just another cloud provider. You know, it's just like any other one. They have storage and services available. But I mean, I'm looking at the price consensus and EPS surprise chart, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, <laughs> I might get in on this for the paper trader portfolio. There you go. But anyway, yeah, the uh, the paper trade. I don't know when you were going to segue into it, but, <laughs> but before I came in here, I was like, all right, how is your portfolio doing? So I was mistaken. Last year when we were in, I thought you and Danny were maintaining were, one for portfolio. Right. I thought you guys had the same thing, but you guys were competing against Correct, each other. Yeah. So, yeah. so I can't remember what you said, but now you're going to have to say it publicly. <laughs> who is beating who? I, I, I guess if it depends on who's up today, because Danny hasn't pulled profits i pulled profits already okay so i've already got money in my pocket and have it back into the into the market so to speak so okay l- let's just jump into the battleground then. yeah we can just jump into the battleground it seems like we're out of really good questions uh thank you everybody hopefully he got to him if you have any other questions get him into the end of the battleground and we'll try to cover him before we close out all right here we go I feel like I'm in the 80s, man. You should see, you'll have to go back and look at the clip. We'll have to play it for you later. Yeah, it's Don't awesome. worry, Danny will play it again one more time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. I already fixed it. <laughs> so I'm actually down today. I took some hits. What's your current portfolio overall? Yeah, how do I see it? Uh, you go to portfolio and then do the drop down. Oh, I'm, so you're I'm hurting, hurting, man. Yeah, I'm hurting today. Almost 8% down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm down today. I, I know we're Disney, both hurting in Disney. Disney yeah. is what's really hurting me. To be honest, I'm looking to double down on that one. Let yeah. me tell you, I like Disney. I was telling you earlier, mm-hmm. I, I was in stuff. I was in a bunch of options uh, last year, and then the stock skyrocketed, which was maybe a couple of months before um, they released Disney Plus. So which that was a fantastic it. trade. Right. Uh, then I got into some more options, and that just kind of you know dribbled away a little bit. Uh, and I'm now out of Disney. Disney is a great company. You take a look at their revenue. Their revenue is skyrocketing, but their earnings are their 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 earnings growth has slowed considerably, and it may be a year or two until they work this out. Well, so, I think today's news is only because of the fact that the head of Disney stepped down. You well, know, Iger's out, so everybody's freaking out. But well, I he mean, was going to retire anyways. At the end of the year. So I think yeah. people are just a little nervous that it happened so early. So I'm not really worried about being down like I am today. It's Disney. They are going to bounce. I mean, they're spending a... T- I just heard there was an announcement and- this morning saying that they're releasing a whole string of new Star Wars like comic books for kids. Yeah, I mean, like, they're, they're a cash machine. Yeah, so. they're a cash machine. I'm down today, but I'm not really going to worry about I, it. I feel but- like that revenue... W- was that something that... 
was impacted because they acquired Fox Media and they just had to kind of turn that around. Well, I think that's what Iger is actually stepping down. From what I read this morning, he's stepping down to actually focus on that deal. Right. So he's not leaving the company, really. I mean, he's still going to be on like the board of directors. No, he's still staying on as an executive chairman. Right. So, I mean, he's not disappearing. So, I don't know why people are freaking out, but it is a little strange to see it take the dip it did today. I don't think people are freaking out because Iger is leaving. First off, that guy has been a fantastic leader. And he's not gone. Uh, He has introduced so many spectacular money producing properties for the company. But, yeah, I mean, he knew he was, everybody knew he was going to be leaving in 2021 anyways. Mm -hmm. They're already looking for replacements. Right. And I think I read somewhere where he had given like 96. Uh, uh, earnings reports and he's been doing this for like 20 years whatever what better time to leave because he is ushered in this fantastic legacy and he's not going to be the one to have to apologize to investors <laughs> that growth is slowing. <laughs> right. Let the new guy right. do it. He's going to get. He's going to work on things that he's passionate about. Yeah. But he doesn't have to be the guy taking all of the arrows and bullets when he when he disappoints people and tells people, "Oh yeah, earnings didn't come." It's funny you say that because uh, it says the reason he stepped down was because he wanted to focus on the creative side. Now that the major projects like the Fox merger and Disney Plus were behind him, yeah. so it sounds like he did what. He wanted and i was just out. like yeah he's just kind of cleaning himself of- yeah that's pc speak for i don't want to be the guy telling everybody that <laughs> At the earnings missed. call yeah. right yeah. but i think it's down because the theme parks were struggling and tourism well, they we talked were- about coronavirus yeah. this is going to have a huge impact you're probably not wrong there they spent a ton of money on that star wars uh, attraction at the theme park and that has been a ghost town so they've got some yeah. wonderful well, and they raise prices which is a huge thing well, I no, think that's it's good. Two hundred dollars a day or something. Well, no, at a certain point you're gonna outprice the average guy who can go. But the Star Wars stuff, I mean, that was a huge disappointment yes. when it was when it was done. And they have all of these additional costs with ESPN. Who knows how much money they're going to be spending? Which on is content. funny. Danny and I were talking about ESPN yesterday because they came out and said they added a bunch of viewership, and I was like, that has got to be the most BS thing I've ever heard. Really? You get if you get Disney Plus, you get ESPN for free. Oh, okay. So, so that's, it's like, yeah. that's how you got right. your viewership. Come on, right. stop pulling my leg. You guys have been having problems for years. By the way, though, I would nibble at it. Uh, for me, if I could buy Disney, if I could get it somewhere around 115 120 I think that would be a great buy. So, yes, it's not. To, I don't believe it's going to shoot up immediately. Who knows? Maybe it will. But... Disney is too great of a property. If it were to pull back some more, I would love to get some Disney, some more Disney. But uh, but yeah, I think that's why it's down. But uh, you know, long term, you know, you talk about ten years. I think Disney is just going to continue yeah. to print. Money. They're never going to disappear. I mean, they are now basically They'll like never a, say never. Well, I mean, it's like a religion, yeah. right? Like I have nieces, and they live on Disney Plus now. Yeah. I mean, every cartoon, they're young, they're four and two, but like everything is Disney, 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 Disney. Like you can't have a kid, I don't feel like, without having Disney in your house. So, I mean, that's not going to stop. It's interesting because when Disney came out, they're like, oh, it's going to kill Netflix. Netflix is not going to be challenged by Disney in any way. I'm glad we're having this conversation because I posed this to you. I was like, how do you feel about Netflix? Because they keep... I've been spending telling, money for years. I've been telling. I remember me and Tracy were talking on her podcast about Netflix, and uh, and I kept saying, "Buy Netflix, just keep on buying it." And I still maintain. You still buy Keep her? on buying it. Buy Netflix, but uh, Disney. Disney Plus is great. I ended up buying Disney Plus uh, to watch Star and, Wars. Though I bet right. Well, I the, and the know, Marvel movies. All they all they that. had was the Mandalorian. <laughs> that was the only new content they had. But right. you know, I'm a big Marvel fan. And I watch all of those superhero movies. I think they're spectacular. They are but good. they have a whole slate of uh, uh, superhero Marvel uh, properties. I don't want to, uh, should I call them movies or TV shows? But they're going to be dropped exclusively for Disney+. Plus. They're also supposed to be putting a bunch of Star Wars properties uh, onto Disney+, Plus as well. So if that's the only place you're going to be able to get your Marvel fix for these new things and Star Wars, it is. The they only pulled place. back on Star Wars yeah. because, you know, I don't think they did the movies all that great. And then when they did that Han Solo, that was a disaster. Yeah, those were not good. You don't like Han Solo? I enjoyed that. <laughs> I, you know, somebody, somebody told me, they says, don't watch Han Solo. You're gonna you're gonna watch it, that was one it of my more and favorites. you're literally gonna turn it off. Now, as, like, as an adult, I was like, "What are you talking about?" Don't watch the Mandalorian either. 
<laughs> I watched The Mandalorian. Like it was pretty it. good. Yeah. It was pretty. Well, I think I watched The Mandalorian because since I had just signed up for Disney, I was desperate to feel like I got my money's worth. Oh, so you had to watch so, it. Yeah, so I wanted to watch it. So I think maybe a lot of people pretended that it's better than it was, but really it, it was a good movie. It was entertaining. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Was I'm it not like, going to be buying a baby Yoda. Dog. Yeah, exactly. That's what but I feel it, like the whole thing was premised on. Was it was still cool, Yoda. though. It was cool. <laughs> Uh, I it. But they have all of these other properties that they're going to be dropping on yeah. Disney. And that was some of the biggest complaints that you hear people saying. There's like, oh, man, this is only for kids. They're going to have a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, and, and I as an adult would agree. I yeah. mean, if you've seen the Marvel movies, how many times are you going to watch those? Right. If you've seen the Star Wars movies, how many times are you going to watch those? Right. you got to have you got to bring something else to the table. Right. But they're also brand new. I mean, they just popped up on the scene. Yeah, How long did it take Netflix I to I feel really like a lot of these guys, they've content, been watching so. Netflix in the wings for years, hoping to probably do this exact same thing that they've created. Right. So they should have been ready to pull the trigger on more media in terms of like new programming to keep people entertained. Like, I right. think we'll be surprised on the content they're going to pump out in the next year. Oh, I'm not. I'm I mean, going to be... The amount of money that they have, I think they wanted to just see how it works and if it will work for them before they start going, all right, here's a billion dollars, let's produce a bunch of content. Yeah. So Well, I mean, they have such a huge catalog. So while it's true they had very little new, unique uh, content specifically for Disney, they have such a, an impressive catalog. Yeah. They knew all, every single parent out there is going to is gonna get Disney for yep, their kids. Right. And then you're going to get a, a bunch of other people who are like, oh, yeah, this is a great movie, mm -hmm. right? The um, But it's funny because... It, they had this big discussion. If Disney, what are they going to pick? Are people going to leave Netflix for Disney or are people going to leave Disney for Apple Plus or right. whatever? So I have Netflix. I have Disney Plus. I have Apple Plus. Um, but you got that I one have, free for a year, Hulu. didn't you? I have Hulu. Well, you get that one free, free with Disney Plus. Amazon. I don't know what I have. Amazon. But Amazon. those are the yeah, Amazon Prime, <laughs> right. of course. And that's that's a hundred bucks now, isn't it? But I feel like that's yeah, worth it. Well, I mean, yeah, you get like that one for free when you get the Prime, so it's kind of like a win-win. Yeah. Win. You get right. free shipping and you get some movies. Awesome, the even though they're is, all from the '80s. But it, everything is so cheap. Good. Everything is so cheap. Yeah. So I'm not thinking to myself, "Oh, I've got five. And I'm spending hundred and fifty dollars a month. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> which six or eight dollars service should I Drop, get rid of? Yeah. Nobody's thinking that. Right. I'm paying, so, yeah. I mean, well, if you break down the Amazon Prime, I'm only paying about, I'd say, 35 bucks a month for my, my streaming. I feel like the win with that one by far is still the shipping. You get the shipping and that just really makes it yeah. It makes it for I can you. tell you, though, Amazon Prime, they've got a lot of fantastic shows, too. Oh. And didn't they just win uh, an award, Academy Award, or wasn't it something? No, I think Netflix did. I th Netflix was, no, was it something. Tale, wasn't it on there? Or that, I thought show? that was Hulu. But there was some, Amazon got an award. They've got some uh, industry something. recognition. But either way, I mean, they've got a ton of great yeah, shows, Yeah, they've got too. a bunch of stuff. As 100%. Well. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, that's my portfolio. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to probably, oh, you know what? F it. I'm sitting where at. What's my market cap? I'm at... Two hundred uh, twenty five hundred dollars, roughly. Oh yeah, let me see. Here. I'm gonna add Dropbox. So you got gonna go for it? Yeah, huh? from the quick numbers yeah. that we saw there. Bungie. I mean, it seems like a. You got a gold stock, Matrix. What's Matrix? Uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, NIO. Uh, that's a uh, the Tesla of China. Let me just say a couple of things. I'm going to uh, embarrass you, uh, <laughs> but you've got Matrix, which is a five. How dare you? You've got NIO, which is a four. So tell me why you bought those. So uh, NIO is a Tesla mate, uh, Tesla of China, the Tesla okay. that's basically all Chinese made, etc. cetera. I, I looked at their stock. I kind of think that the Chinese are very self-centric. I mean, they've shown that with a lot of the products they do produce. So why not bet on the Chinese Tesla to win? So To uh, win what? Well, to get in on the game and make money selling cars in china basically just he, he, he believes that it's going to take the market share in china other than tesla doing right. that was going to be their competitor factory. right so that, that's why I, I picked that one I mean, that was actually a re recommendation from somebody else that had brought it up because uh, i'm such a it's interesting look i got no problem making bets uh, that's the why i put the money yeah. in. it was a, it was a bet I yeah. put 400 into it. It's, it that's a bet making bets is fine just as long as you don't overcommit right. on a bet so, and I made that very yeah. clear when I put and it in there. And the majority of your portfolio should be on logical decisions. But yes, there is some money that uh, that we all do it. That's like, 
I think this is going to be huge. So I'm willing to put a bet on this. And if I lose all of it or a large chunk of it, so be it. So there's nothing wrong with making those bets. But don't fill up your portfolio with lottery tickets and because I didn't. you're going to regret it. This was I even announced that when That's I put it in there. Advice. I put $400 into it. It's a bet uh, to kind of defend myself a little bit here the pharmaceutical <laughs> and the gold the gold i actually bought because of the fact that at that point in time i can't remember what was going on in the markets but people were freaking out so i figured i should have something to hedge against something it was you know. during the trade war or trade spat as as kevin likes yeah, to i call can't it. remember what it was specifically say, but i I've, wanted to hedge i've said this on our zuss videos all the time and i want to say it right here the don't freak out about anything, not just for you, but anybody, especially over the last two years when we had this trade spat. People were talking about recession and the inverted yield curve and, oh, my goodness, well, what's going to happen? All of that stuff was nonsense. All people need to do, and especially now with the coronavirus, take a look at four metrics. You look at GDP. You look at unemployment. You look at consumer sentiment or consumer confidence. And you look at interest rates. If you look at those four things, you will always be able to keep your head on straight. You'll be able to understand what the big picture is. And you'll understand, too, if I see a pullback, is this the beginning of the end or is this a gift that I should take advantage of and load up on some of my favorite stocks? Because the GDP, right, recession, you have to have two quarters in a row of negative growth. Right now, even with the coronavirus taking some points off of our expected GDP, we are still on pace for our annual GDP to come in stronger than the average GDP of the entire 11 years of this bull market expansion. So even if you have slightly slower GDP growth this year because of the coronavirus, slightly slower GDP growth is not a recession. And even slightly slower GDP growth is still better than the average GDP growth that has preceded it. So you look great there. 50-year low unemployment. Tell me the last time we had a recession with 50-year yeah. low unemployment. It doesn't happen. Right. Consumer sentiment is a huge barometer because 70% of our GDP comes from consumer spending. If the consumer is healthy and they're excited and confident, you're, probably, you're not going to see a recession. Which I was reading this morning. If a consumer starts to take a a little of a bit of a break here we could be seeing a little trouble i wouldn't worry about it either because the consumer feels uh confident because there's more people working so if if the person has a good job if the person is working he's gainfully employed he feels like right he's making more money i mean come on household income is at the highest right. level in 20 years so so the the, the even if there is a dip in consumer sentiment, it's going to take a – you would need to see something dramatic happen in order to foreshadow some kind of demise for our economy. But anyway, those are the three things. And then you have interest rates. The, there, if you were to look at the last 50 years, we've never seen a recession with the Fed funds rate under 4%. So right now, what's the Fed funds rate? Uh, was it 1.65 or something like that? Let's take a look. I think that's the mid price. Two percent. Or uh, well, actually, I'm just looking at the number that popped up. Yeah, I could be wrong. I yeah, know. I think it's one point six five. I think that's the mid price. Either way, that is your if since since the, the first, so far one point seven five right. Yeah, now. that's the high end, and then you have one five. So one point six two five is the midpoint. So, anyways, the 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 Fed has pretty much said that they weren't going to do anything with interest rates uh, this year, but now with the coronavirus potentially slowing things down, there's a possibility that you may see the Fed come in and lower rates this year. That would be another benefit for the market. But the point I'm getting at is, you know, when things get, you know, scary or you, you read headlines and you start to get nervous and then you hear the talking heads on TV making outlandish, ridiculous statements, don't listen to any of it. Just look at those four things. Those four things are your guiding light. And if you follow those, then you'll be able to make rational decisions. And I'll say, people, if anybody who reads my PFP, 
they have seen me right over the last, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, this year. How, how do people get your PFP, by the way? Uh, you just sign up on Zax.com and you'll be able to get it. So just go there, sign up for it, and it'll be in your inbox every single morning. But the point is, even when people were hysterical about recession and all of these things, all I kept on telling people was, don't pay attention. Keep on buying this market. And granted, I mean, this is one of the best markets we've ever had, so it's easy to be right. But when everybody was talking about the sky is falling, I wasn't. And it's because of those things I look at. So always look at those things and you'll make good decisions. To pull a famous matrix line, you're always right. Tell you not. Tell <laughs> <laughs> you're not. Tell you not. But I'll tell you, I am not a per uh, permable. There will be a time, one of these years, you are going to see a pullback in the market. It is inevitable. It's going to happen at some point. I think it is several years down the road, but it will happen. And when it does happen, there's going to be clues. You'll, you'll see it coming. And don't think you're going to get out at the very top. You won't. But you'll, you'll know when it feels like this is the end. But let me go back. Not feel, you'll see yeah, the that, there, there. that something is happening. But when that happens, then I will be changing my tune. But right now, I am bullish, and I believe that uh, that's the way to be. And again, I cannot stress it enough, pay attention to those four things. Those are some uh, good advice coming from Eric's portfolio. So just limit your risk, basically, and don't react emotionally. Kind of pay attention to those metrics that are going to give you more of a, a truthful story than than what we're seeing kind of within the media and the, you, the you talking like heads. kicking me in the pants anymore? Well, hang on. on to Let, let's beat up Danny. So how do I, how do I get <laughs> well, to Well, yeah, you? I was going to get to mine. Okay, Danny, man. So Madison. currently I'm okay, but I, I don't like to see what's going on in the market. So I'm a little bit hesitant to jump in uh, kind of like Eric did today on Dropbox. I do have my eye on three stocks. I do want to double down on Disney, which we currently do own. Uh, we're not too bad <clears throat> on where we got in on the price target. We were sitting at 134. It's 125 today. Um, I kind of like what uh, Kevin was saying. I do like the, the the price target of around 120 to start kind of averaging back into this. Um, but I'm also looking at Apple and Facebook. I always really kind of wanted to get in those stocks. I felt like they were a little overvalued, um, uh, just too expensive for me at least. Um, but with the, the correction in the market right now with the corona fear, uh, I feel like there might be some opportunity, but I feel like there's more downside. So I personally am waiting to kind of get into those stocks just because of, of where I feel like we, we could get a little bit more of a pullback. So, And I feel like if you were to get into Apple, you should picked them up when they came out with that announcement they were going to mess yeah i i don't know I, it, it's tough to say with with this market it, i'm playing it very hesitant um with individual stocks um i do kind of like looking at the s p uh and kind of getting in, into the broader sector of it and, and not in individual stocks and playing it that way but uh those are currently the the three ones that i'm looking at we're not sitting too uncomfortable going into earnings for square today um, we did make uh, our, our jump back. It was it used to be down at, at 60s um, when we first got in here at 78 dollars. So seeing some money there. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ride it through. Um, obviously, again, we've reiterated this a lot through our shows that this is a long term play for me. Um, I'm not just gonna be getting in and out. So I do see this as a, a long term hold. Um, so we're gonna hold through these earnings and hope for a good report after the close today. Um, and then we have uh, some some dividend aristocrats where we get our uh dividends from and at&t again another dividend play just more individual so the uh, i'm looking at square so you're saying they're reporting today after the close so let Correct. me see what the earnings esp says let's see what are they saying oh i'm so oh. sure it's saying good stuff so the earnings esp is predicting a 3.59 percent positive earning surprise mm -hmm. so that's interesting so good 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 uh, by the way, what do you guys do for risk management? I saw one of your stocks, Danny, uh, was down 7%. By the way, that's uh, GW what, Pharma. What's, your, what's your worst stock? My worst stock? Yeah. Probably Kingross. Down what? Uh, well, Disney's down right now. Let me go back. Yeah, to my but portfolio. down what? So, for uh, Kingross is up right now, but it was down. Who cares? From Inception, what are you up or down? Inception? Yes. When you bought it. Oh, when yeah, I bought it? Oh, yeah. Right now, I'm up. Okay. I'm up on it. Okay. The uh, So, so GW Pharma was more my. 
I guess, riskier plays. As you can see, a lot of the other ones are kind of more of a stable plays for me. Um, GW Pharma was a cannabis play we got into. Um, they were more of the company that wasn't in the limelight of cannabis. They kind of wanted to take a back seat on it right? Um, because they didn't want to get all the, the heat that the cannabis industry was getting. Um, but yeah, that is the more volatile stock that we, we did get into. Uh, we're, we, we bought into it at 113. Uh, we've seen it go up to about $120 and, and vice versa, come back down. So it is one of our more riskier plays, but we only bought in a, a small percentage uh, with only three shares. Which that's that, going to so. win no matter what. You just got to wait that well, one out. Again, I mean, you do have to pay attention if it does get to a point where, you know, it's starting to hurt your portfolio more than help it. Uh, we will have to reevaluate. But again, yeah, it is a, a riskier play that we did take. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, we're doing okay for the, the time being. Yeah. So. For these riskier plays, like, uh, you know, these marijuana stocks, I do believe you have to give them a little bit more room, knowing how volatile they are. Right. And one of these days, these marijuana stocks are going to hit. Uh, They're going to be gold. Uh, yeah. But which maybe, ones? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, you, you, you have no idea. But the point I want to get at is I didn't see any big red in your portfolio. So kudos to you guys. But I, for me, I typically like to cut my losses at 10%. There are some stocks that I may allow 15 or 20 if they're hyper volatile or I, you know, the, I have a, a long term uh, outlook on it. Uh, and I just have, you know, maybe I have a, uh, a, a you know, personal affinity to it. But by and large, I will typically pull the plug at a 10% loss. Whether I like it or not, it is an emotionless decision, and I think that is one of the best ways to sell to 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 you know maintain your portfolio. Because if you there's plenty of one of these days, you know, the market is going to you know go down for real, and like I said, maybe a couple of years from now, but but you never know when it's going to happen. But sometimes people have 30% losers, 40% losers, 50% yeah, losers, 70% losers. But aside from those ridiculous gap down tragedies that, you know, steal your money, usually the guy who's sitting with a 50% loss, he could have gotten out when it was down 10%. He could have gotten out when it was down 15, 20, 30, but 40. But he's still holding that. And it's like those kinds of decisions will ruin your portfolio. And worse, they ruin your confidence. Yep. Because the next time something good so comes true. by, you're afraid to pull the trigger. And then you see this great stock that you wanted to buy, you didn't do because you remember how painful it was on that last right. disaster. Then that goes up and you miss it. Then the next one you see... Same thing. That, you want to buy it, that ends up going up, but you missed it. Then the next one comes along, and it's like, oh, I can't believe I missed those last two. Now, the pain of missing out on those profits is bigger than the pain of losing that 50%. Now you get into that one, and you're so desperate to make that money back. back. That, right? <laughs> you get in, that one goes down, and then you hang on to that for a loser. Right. It is a horrible, vicious cycle. So on the flip get, side, though. Get out at 10 or whatever is comfortable for you but get out because you can always get back in or you can put your money on a different horse that doesn't have right. all of that baggage you hit the nail on the head i think of saying it's not an emotion thing like look at the numbers yeah like, if you can't handle that 50 percent loss you should have been out of 10 right danny yeah. say what you're going to say but let me say one more thing too i Just I, I i hear people then jump in i hear people say Oh, I, I, I can't do it. I, I feel terrible taking the loss. I have zero care if I take a loss. I actually feel empowered because I'm doing something that most mediocre investors can't do. They can't wrestle with their emotion and cut their loss on a losing stock. I always, I've always looked at it like this. If I was going the wrong way down a one-way street, am I going to speed up? No, I'm going to stop and turn around and get off as soon as I can. That is how I believe you should look at investing. Don't hold on and hope nobody hits you. Don't speed up. Add more money to your losing position, right. hoping everything's going to turn out. Get off and start going the right way on a different stock. Danny, what were you going to say? So I, I totally agree with you. I mean, people <clears throat> need to limit their risk. But I guess at what point 
do you do i guess do you pay attention to that stock after you dropped it um i mean say you drop it at 10 percent, it goes down to 15 but then it starts to do that reversal are you still paying attention but or emotionally or are you just kind of like turning that that switch off where you're not trying to get sometimes down that I, rabbit hole. sometimes i don't pay attention to it sometimes i do right and sometimes it goes up and it's like no damn it yeah <laughs> uh, and sometimes it goes down lower and i'm like oh whew, whew. i'm a genius yeah thank god but the thing is, there's been stocks that I have gotten out of, and it's like, okay, if it goes here, I'll get back in. If it goes lower, I know where I want to get in. If it goes higher, I know where I will get back in. So I'll do it, um, and I don't care. But, but yes, sometimes I, I will look at it. But I always think to myself this, and this is part of my decision-making process. If I'm in and it goes lower, let's say I'm down 10% or whatever, mm. and I think to myself, okay, if I hold this stock and it goes lower, how bad am I going to feel? Versus if I get out and I follow my own rule and get out at 10% and then it goes higher, how bad am I going to feel? If I'm going to feel worse holding on to that stock when I knew I shouldn't have and, and it goes down lower, then I'm going to get out. So it's like, where am I going to feel worse? So that's what I would do. But again, I all... I can always get back in, but if I wanted to get out of 10 and now all of a sudden it's down 15 or 20, I can't magically get out at the 10% right. that I wish I yeah. would have. Just but go back in time, if yeah. I'm out at 10 and then it goes up an extra couple of points, and again, sometimes I want to see it completely retrace 10% or I want to, you know, it'll maybe it'll only go up a couple of percent, but I can always get back in. But my point is, when I'm getting into a stock, I'm not getting into a stock so it can go up 2 3 4%. Usually, I'm expecting something to go up 20 30 50%. So if I have to miss out on a couple of points, who cares? Because I'm not looking for a two-point move. I'm looking right. for something pretty big. So, yes. Get out when you get out while you can, because if you don't, it'll ruin your portfolio. And I remember reading something a long time ago, right? If 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 you're down 50 percent, you have to make a 100 percent return to get that money back. And if you're so slick that you can pick up a 100 percent return, why did you just get clobbered for 50 percent? Right. So get it because if you're down 10 percent you only need an 11 percent move to get that money back but if you're down 50 percent you've got to double that that next trade you've got to get a 100 percent return to get it back do that it's, money management is the most overlooked yeah. part of investing and that is where people screw themselves up so important yeah and i, I just one last note and you can correct me if i'm wrong i remember hearing uh, I don't know if it was a famous day trader or what, but he said something along the lines of that he has lost more than he's won, but he's been able to basically turn a profit due to his way of limiting risk. Is that something that it, that rings true to you, that you will lose more than you win as I'm a, a successful trader? I'm assuming he means he's probably lost more trades than he's won. Obviously, right. yeah, his winnings are... But, but, yeah. but the, the winnings are out. Yeah, out if he's making losses. 500% returns on his big bets, but he gets out of, you know, ah, I tried this one, this didn't work out. Small loss here, small loss here, small loss here. So if you have a bunch of small losses, but then you have some big spectacular winners or a lot of you know uh, 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 good sized winners that will make up for those tiny little nibbles that you take those elsewhere. Ten percent, so, yes. that You don't have to worry about. Totally true. Totally true. Okay. All right. So speaking of getting out, <laughs> I uh, think we would like to thank Kevin for showing up. Thanks, yeah, Kevin. Buddy. Hopefully, we can get you back here in the studio sometime. Twenty twenty one. Hopefully not. Hopefully, we can get you in here before then. So thank you for coming in today, right. Kevin. Uh, for everybody out there, still, I, I hope that this was you know useful. We had him here for a lot longer than we normally go. So please, if you guys miss something, please go back, leave a comment. We'll try to get it to him. Uh, and in short, Danny, you got anything? No, just uh, make sure to go to our zax.com slash promo. Check out that Insider Traders with Tracy. Make sure to always leave a like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff with us here. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next week. And with that, guys, we will see you soon. Peace.